everyone. How are you guys doing? Um, I'm Lauren Beerley. I'm an installation artist, and I'm also the manager of special exhibitions and projects at the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, my artwork deals with um, perception in spatial and, uh, and visual means, and then also color theory. And I'm Clorinda Macklow, and I am an artist that works with systems and interpersonal relationships, and I use performance, installation, video, whichever tool gets the job done for the investigation I'm conducting. Um, hi, I'm Allison Parrish. I'm a programmer, a poet, a game designer, and I'm a member of the full-time faculty at New York University's Interactive Telecommunications Program. I'm just going to do... Is that okay? <laughs> um, so we're here because... We are collaborating on a project called Incredible Witness. And what Incredible Witness does is it works with um, a series of games and interactive environments. It's, and it's a public engagement and a participatory event. And we're looking at, and this makes sense that it comes after Kareem, actually makes a lot of sense because it's about understanding sensory perception as the deep root of empathetic connection. And so we want to use these understanding other people's sensory worlds as a way to provoke discussion and uh, give a sense of how we all operate. So, and we felt that using games would be one of the most effective ways of bringing people into different sensory worlds because games invite um, a commitment to the moment and a kind of full participatory uh, immersion. And we treated these events as kind of public laboratories and all the visitors were co-researchers. And so we did several experiments and we'll be presenting here some of the most successful experiments so far. And I'll be talking about something called the direction game. Lauren will discuss unlikely traits. And Allison will talk about our uh, game design exercise that was part of every event. So um, when we thought of making the sensory games, we realized that it would kind of make sense to really go into our own sensory worlds first, right? You have to start with yourself and then go outward. Um, and for me, I was curious to see if I could bring people into my own state of direction confusion. I have trouble getting to places, so a lot of trouble. Um, so basically, the game became a mediated race, uh, where players were attempting to get from point A to point B, but they had to follow the directions on a deck of 30 cards. So this is an example. Um, and so part of why you see people doing odd things in the street is this state includes for me, it's not just about a difficulty with wayfinding, but I'm embarrassed about asking for directions. I'm very shy, self-conscious about doubling back, rerouting. Um, so we design the cards to kind of specifically cause that state. Um, for example, walk backwards for 15 steps or stand still for 20 seconds, then proceed. Um, and we worked together, the three of us, to figure out how to make the decisions that were presented challenging but fun and frustrating the way it is, but still exciting. Um, and since much of my previous work has been done in creating like interactive performances and interventions and installations in unusual spaces or in in the outside world, I, I drew on that knowledge to figure out how to make the game work in different, like, real-world situations. A park, a street corner, church basement. Um, and we wanted to bring that game into the real world, so to speak, uh, to raise the stakes and give the playing a sense of risk. And I incorporate some of the tools I've used in my own personal navigation practice when going around the city, which is subterfuge, delaying tactics, pretending I know people, looking at my phone. Um, and so people would get a visceral sense of what it meant to be in that state. Um, and so at every event, we asked people for reactions, right? Um, and these are some of the reactions that we got. And it seems that 
people found the game both unnerving and fun, and that the gameplay was most interesting for those who fully committed to the situation or willing to put themselves in my shoes, so to speak, and literally. Um, and you really couldn't play it halfway. So I'm going to now hand this off to Lauren. So I'm going to talk about um, Unlikely Traits. So Unlikely Traits is a card game encouraging participants to draw associations between familiar visuals and their senses. Um, I developed Unlikely Traits from my own sensory perception, as Clarinda was explaining earlier. I have synesthesia. So the inspiration for the game was um, synesthesia, which is a neurological phenomenon, um, where one sensory stimulus triggers another. Uh, in my case, letters and numbers trigger colors, and uh, this is known as graphene color synesthesia. Um, and then this is my chart of colors that are associated with letters. Now, many scientists believe there are at least 80 different types of synesthesia, and that as many as 1 in, ten, one in 100 people um, may experience this. There are other common iterations, I'll name off a few. Um, it's ordinal linguistic personification, where a sequence... Um, uh, like letters or numbers, has personalities. There's chromesthesia, where tr sound triggers color, and uh, spatiotemporal, where sequences like days of the week inhabit a synesthete's like, environment. Now, uh, synesthesia is entirely subjective, and I wanted to uh, create this card game to help others share in this experience or just understand it in general. So my approach was to borrow an existing uh, game structure and modify it to the needs of my perception, and I chose categories. Uh, categories I chose because it's, uh, it can be enjoyed by a diverse player audience. It encourages conversation and an interpretation of answers, and it draws connection between players especially. All things I wanted to do with this game. But the um, bad thing about it is that it's individually driven and it's uh, competitive. So I wanted a game that was more inclusive and encouraged more teamwork. So again, um, the premise of Unlikely Traits is to draw sensory connections from stimulus in your environment. Um, for instance, what does the number 73 taste like? Does it taste sour? Does it taste like spicy, smooth? So it tastes like an apple, maybe turkey. One player draws a card from four decks of stimulus, in this case, color, letter, number, and shape. And everyone spends a minute writing down as many associations in response to the sensory round that you happen to be on. Taste, smell, sound, personification. When you finish, you share answers, identifying connections with other players, and defining allies with those who, you thought, or who think similarly to you and with the hopes of bonds being formed. What was interesting about watching people play and then reading their feedback is that commonalities of sensory unawareness in this exercise. The toughest sensory rounds were taste and sound. There were fewer answers, but more common answers focusing on generalities like volume, sweet or salty, etc. But nothing super specific. People had different opinions about the potential success of the game, and uh, some people said that the game made them realize how varied the English language was, um, and that it made it difficult for the group to connect or interpret similar meanings. And others immediately connected and wanted to continue playing and learning about each other and eventually exchange numbers at the end of the, the session. So I leave you with this story about crossing language barriers. This is a really fun thing that happened during one of our experiments. Um, what does this shape sound like to you? To an English speaker participant, it was the sound of staccato. To a Japanese speaking participant, it was pump, pump, pump. The group of players were ecstatic with the discovery of concluding, we must be all much more similar than we realize. Now I'll pass this on to Allison. <coughs> Um, 
Okay, so those were two of the games that we um, that we did as part of these events, um, and sort of the the core idea of Incredible Witness is um, that games as interactive models can help people understand how an underlying system works. Um, so the underlying system, in the case of of the games that we just talked about, um, is the way that another person's perception and sensation of the world works. So. Since the process of designing these games for other people to play was so successful for us personally in organizing our thoughts about what we wanted to do with the experiment, um, we thought that we would add that as an activity to the laboratory, to the, um, to the events that we were planning for other people, um, so that they'd be able to uh, make their own games about their own perception and sensation um, as a way to synthesize their understanding of the games that we had made um, and also maybe give them a chance to design their own games that would help other people understand their own ways of perceiving the world. Um, so just to give you an idea of how that worked, um, we did like a game prototyping exercise with them, basically. If you've taken like an introductory game design class, it's very similar to what you would do in, in that class. Um, the, the game itself that we made was adapted from... Uh, a game uh, design exercise made by Eric Zimmerman, a game designer and a game design instructor. Um, the basic idea is that we wanted the players to create a game that's about their perception of the world, to think of all the ways that your perception of the world maybe differs from that of other people's, are there tasks that are easy for you to do that are difficult for others, um, things that you immediately notice that other people don't. Um, and we tried to make it very clear that it didn't have to be like something that you're like diagnosed with or something like that. It's um, just something, uh, something that uh, you want other people to understand about you. Um, so we had each group of designers, we gave them 30 minutes and there were usually groups of four or five. Um, and I brought some um, game prototyping materials like game tokens and uh, decks of cards and pieces of paper. And um, the idea was that they would quickly iterate on game design ideas, play test, make up a system of rules, play test it, um, evaluate it by, by seeing if people had fun. If it didn't work, then throw it out, um, and then repeat the process, iterating on that prototype. With the idea being that you don't spend a lot of time like trying to come up with a great idea, you're just trying new things over and over and over again. Um, there was not a lot of focus on how the games looked. It wasn't about making them look good. It was about designing that system. Um, so this is what the game design process usually looked like. Um, every group that attempted the game design task came up with an awesome game. Like I was, I was surprised and encouraged by the results of this experiment. Um, a few of my favorites I'm just going to describe really quickly. Um, and these are names that I came up with. If you've ever designed a game, you know that uh, coming up with a name for it is the most difficult part. It might take you 30 minutes to design the game, but then a couple of months to come up with a name for it. Um, so I just made up these, these names for the game. So one game that a group made was called, or I'm calling it Perceptiveness Pictionary, um, where players uh, would individually kind of wander around the venue where we uh, held this event, and they would write down all the things that they noticed in the room. Um, and then after a time limit, the players would get back together and then share what they'd noticed. And if any two people had noticed the same thing, then they would get a point. Um, so it was sort of like Pictionary, like positive Pictionary, but for just being perceptive about a space. Um, they designed a game called, or I'm calling uh, Scissors to Apples, because it's sort of like uh, Apples to Apples, but you play it with scissors and paper. Um, so there, a judge would randomly select a noun and adjective combination from a deck. And then players would use uh, scissors and scrap paper to make a paper cutout that matches the description. Um, and then the judge would select the player, the, the paper sculpture that best matches the pair. Um, and then uh, a game that they designed I'm calling Face Charades, um, in which they made a list of emotions on a card, on a deck of cards. And you would draw one at random, and the other players would um, have to guess which emotion the current player drew from the deck based on that player's facial expression, which is just a way of like playing a game that's about guessing other people's uh, internal emotional states through their facial expression. So in general, we were super happy with the results of this uh, exercise, um, both as a way for people to understand what we were doing um, to synthesize the ideas of the experiment. Um, and it was also good because it helped us generate some new ideas about the kinds of games we would want to do at the event in the future.
Um, so I think Clarinda is going to come back up for some synthesis here. And then you'll come back up. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we'll just keep rotating. Um, so part of how we're evaluating this uh, ex set of experiments, we are borrowing some tools from sociology and trying to get some at least a qualitative sense of how this affects people's um, understanding of others. And, and through that, we want to figure out, like, how does the game work? What other games can we do? And so we had some surveys. And um, we just got their reaction to the game, figured out what actually would help. And this is what we mean by a public lab laboratory. It's like citizen scientists or um, any other uh, crowdsourced way of researching. Um, and so we borrowed tools and see, like, so people would tell us, like, how they felt and if they, in fact, and then we also had an entrance interview where we asked people, well, what, what would you want to make a game about? What about your perception? And so just to proliferate the amount of different people that we could source and find ways of being that would help, like, the more you know how other people exist, in a sensory way, the more you understand that the other divisions we put up are, are pretty surface, really. Um, so then, Allison, would you like to? Yeah, sure. Is that video? I don't know. <laughs> Should I? I don't know. Yep, you got it. Huh. Oh, there you go. Yes. There we go. It's a little bit harder to see than I would hope it would be. Um, so this is the graphene color machine, which is a piece that I made um, in collaboration with uh, Lauren. Um, she was describing to me, as part of our discussion about some of the seizures, she was describing to me how it looked when she was typing, um, because she has graphene color synesthesia. Uh, when the way that she described it is that like the letters would appear first as the color and then sort of fade away. Um, so this is, I made this a just like really quick uh, JavaScript program that, um, that I wish you could see a little bit better. I should have thought about the light levels <laughs> when I made this. Um, but basically, as you're typing, the letters appear in the way that, that Lauren described them to me, and then they fade away. This was part of our most recent uh, exhibition of these, of these experiments. Um, and we see pieces like these as one potential future direction for the project. We'd love to start making more pieces like this that comment on the way the technology interacts with our perceptions, um, and also pieces that are available on the web so that people can interact with them. They don't have to attend one of the events. Um, so that is all we have. This is the um, URL of the experiment. So visit it and uh, let us know what you think. Thank you.